Welcome back. It's Monica. Hello. Um, today, I mean, this month, actually, it's an important month. It is Endometriosis Awareness Month. No? You don't? No? Nobody? Nobody? It's just my, my dog and my two cats and I here. So, um, I'm going to do my best this video because I have endometriosis and I've never once kind of like gone through my whole story from start to finish before. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm literally going to talk openly and honestly about getting misdiagnosed when I was a little kid with other things to getting diagnosed finally with endometriosis and then um, what treatment has been like since I've been diagnosed and I guess basically, you know, what the future could look like for me um, with endometriosis. So before I kind of get into all of that, I first want to say that this video is not going to be for everybody. Um, endometriosis is actually a disease that affects one in 10 women. So think of 10 women in your life. One of them definitely has endometriosis. And let me tell you, this disease is chronic. There's no cure for it. It sucks. My understanding of endometriosis is that it is basically when if a female gets their period every single month, their uterine lining sheds, bleeds, and that's where it comes from is the uterus. Now, women with endometriosis, we don't just bleed there. We bleed everywhere internally. So our body doesn't kind of know um, to shed, it sheds the lining in the uterus every, every month or every three months if we're on birth control, whatever the case is. Um, every woman is different with what they're going through, but basically it's when you're internally bleeding and you're not supposed to, which leads to a ton of the fun stuff. Um, building up of scar tissue, it attaches to organs. It can lead to infertility women there are some women out there that cannot have babies because of this disease so not only can they not have children but they could also be dealing with pain every single day insomnia oftentimes fibromyalgia is a disease connected along with this and who knows whatever else um it is exhausting to go through every single day when you don't know what the day is gonna feel like for you and your health, how much energy you're gonna have, um, if you're gonna have a good pain day or a bad pain day. Things can always be really up in the air and when you're a person like me that likes to know what to expect, um, having a chronic disease kind of definitely, it will definitely takes that away from you, that level of control because there are some days, and thank goodness, you know, I have the ability to work permanently um, full-time remote from home, but there are definitely days where I'm like, if I didn't, I can't move from this couch. Like, my pain is so bad. So I'll have, like, my heating pad and then my laptop on top of my heating pad and then my phone by my ear. And Anyways... The beginning of my story with endometriosis or I guess um, when I was a kid when I was a little girl um, you know first first getting my period or when Aunt Flo first came if we want to be uh, correct in that sense um, I was 12 years old and I was like oh oh my gosh <laughs> literally like Oh my gosh, this is not right. Um, this is just not right. Got over that shock. Um, my my periods growing up, whenever Aunt Flo would come, let me tell you, she never knew when she was coming to town. Um, 
she would skip a month where I wouldn't see Aunt Flo at all. Um, she'd skip two months. Where is she at? I don't know. You guys know, I don't know. Um, so my periods when I was from the jump were, were irregular. They were always super heavy flow too. Um, yeah, very heavy flow to the point where there were times when soaking through my pants were a thing because at the time, I mean, I was, you know, what, like 12, 13, you know, I was kind of like afraid of the whole tampon thing and like just anything kind of going up there <laughs> at the time. So I like wore pads, right? And there was, at the time, pads didn't have all these like protective entities, <laughs> you know, holding everything in. So like things would leak and that was embarrassing like for a little girl that is traumatizing oh is it traumatizing um <laughs> that's all I'll say about that but yeah so irregular heavy flow and bad cramps so whenever flow would come and be like hello I'm here I would be like, oh, for like maybe like the week before. And then I remember the first few days that she arrived or hello, she would be like, oh, like little hamster nails clawing at my ovaries and my insides, like dying to get out. That was how it felt. Like I would be doubled over in pain. And my mom would be like, you know, with the heating pad and she'd be like, I'm so sorry, like Motrin, you know, and just w what you regularly do, right? I mean, that's, that's what you did. And then eventually we went to see my OBGYN. Um, like what the heck is going on? Why are her periods like this? They're irregular, they're painful. Basically I got diagnosed with painful periods. Thanks. So, painful periods. Uh, my mom and I left like, okay, I have a great doctor. This is what she's telling me must, must be that. Went on a birth control because we figured that maybe me being on a birth control would help to regulate things. It might help some of the cramps and then get me on, you know, an every single month cycle. Should, should be a great thing, right? Um, so actually that worked for a while. I did end up becoming regular. Granted, I still had very, very, very painful periods. A few to the point where my doctors actually thought that I had ovarian cysts burst because every once in a while, um, maybe three times in a year, I would get pain so bad during my during my period that I literally like was throwing up and I could not walk. I was like crawling to the bathroom. Um, and my doctors basically said that you kind of experienced labor pain. So there's that. Um, uh, and then also you probably had ovarian cysts first that you didn't even know were there. So you're probably, you're fine. You know, well, whatever. I'm like, what? you know, again, you're talking to a teenager still at this point. Like I still hadn't even gone away to university. Hi Tucker. Gosh, that bone noise is going to be aggravating. Anyways, another thing that I want to point out really quick just to point out is that I was put on birth control not for contraception okay I was put on birth control to regulate my periods because I was in an insurmountable amount of pain and we thought that that might help okay so again birth control is not always used as a way to not have a baby Birth control can be used for health reasons. Just throwing that out there. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, fun times. Um, 
painful periods, then I became sexually active. Sorry, Mom. Um, it happened. Goodness. Do you see that? He, mm, he doesn't care that I'm... I'll just... Keep going, Tuck. I'll wait. You done? Tucker. <laughs> Will you read out of that, please? Anybody want a dog? Where did I leave off? Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, mom. Uh, yeah, definitely became sexually active um, before marriage, which I wasn't raised to do, but hey, that's what happened. So there it is. Um, and I ended up going away to university and I went key part of the story here. I went away to college with my painful periods, still being kind of confused, just on the birth control route. And anyways, graduated sales and business marketing, a bachelor's of business administration, came home, went to the doctor, was just doing, you know, my normal doctor rounds, I suppose you could call them. So I went to my OBGYN, got my normal you know pap smear done and all of that fun stuff ladies you understand and um my pap smear results came back abnormal um and i was te i was tested positive for a strain of hpv here we go just really quick hpv is very very common 84% of people walking around at one point or another will have a strain of HPV at some point. So let's start there. I came back positive for a strain of HPV. And specifically, when they took a look at my cervical cells, which is what a pap smear kind of like looks at, is the cells on a cervix to see if they're healthy or not. They were definitely abnormal abnormal to the point where my cells showed um, what is called high-grade dysplasia. And that basically meant that my there were cells in my cervix that were precancerous. They were not cancerous yet, but they sure as shit were on their way. This is really, really scary. Definitely not the news that we wanted. Um, I remember almost disassociating for a while because I remember when I had told my boyfriend at the time, he broke up with me, called me a whole bunch of names and all of that. Um, it was horrible because um, then I, you know, went through it alone. But anyways, the treatments for that. Um, so amongst like many tests, you know, you're, you're getting invaded and in all the spots that you really kind of don't want to be invaded in and ultrasounds, all of that stuff. They decided, you know, that a leap procedure and a conization, um, was necessary. So this is basically what they did was they burned off all of the cells, you know, that really shouldn't have been there. And then they actually had to remove a part of my cervix as well. I know, I'm just so lucky. Anyway, that was, so that was like my first kind of experience and I'm not even into the endometriosis yet, but why I wanted to bring that up was because first of all, ladies getting tested for it's so important um and i'm not just talking like as 
pap, pap testing, but like STD testing guys, you know, same thing goes for you too. I know you can't, you don't have a cervix. <laughs> Good for you. Um, but just get tested for stuff like that. Because again, HPV is super, super, super common, but for women, it can cause, I literally almost got cervical cancer from it. So, um, yeah, make sure you stick to your exams. Um, yeah. Now, um, one of the things that I'm like kind of questioning now that I'm further into my life, um, my wisdom, if you'd want to call it that regarding endometriosis or just living it with a certain amount of time. I now know that they could have diagnosed me with endometriosis or at least cervical endometriosis at that time of doing the leap procedure because they had visibility into seeing, you know, that I had scar tissue all around my cervix and all of that. So a part of me wants to say, why wasn't I diagnosed with endometriosis then? Actually, a big part of me wants to say that because it created comp more complications for me down the road. So now I'm graduated from college, which is great. I, you know, now my pap smear results came back normal. I'm on the mend, but my God, I'm still having painful, er like painful periods. Oh my goodness, my sleep is off. I'm just exhausted all the time. I'm spotting in between periods. So I'm bleeding when I definitely shouldn't be, when I'm not scheduled to. This is weird. This is off. What is going on? I went to an urgent care one day because my cramps were so bad that again, I was throwing up. I couldn't walk. My boyfriend at the time drove me. I was sent home. I was, you know, examined again, poked, prodded, invaded. Hello. Um, and they basically said, you have pelvic inflammatory disease. Here are a bunch of medicines for you. There's a bunch of antibiotics. If you cannot stomach these antibiotics, you need to go to the ER. That's what I was told. So here I go with my scripts to the pharmacy, get them filled, come home, take the first round. And then I have, you know, my eyes crossed. I'm praying to the Holy Lord and that I can keep these medicines down. And sure enough, bleep, nope, not keeping them down. Um, to the ER I went. My mom meets me at the hospital, of course she does. Um, P.S. My mom is one of the most like supportive and biggest like advocates for like taught me to be an advocate as well for my health, for other people's health, um, mental health, you know, things like that. She is just such an inspiration. So PS, hi mom, I love you. And thank you for always being there for me and being my advocate and my voice when I wasn't always able to. Um, shout out, cause not everybody has that. Um, again, that's one of the reasons why I'm posting this video because there could be a girl out there that watches this that's like, I have irregular periods. I, you know, spot in between them. I have a ton of pain. Having a ton of pain is never going to be, is not normal. Unless there's something going on, right? Period. So, don't let a doctor dictate or or make or make you question or make you if you ha, if you and your gut feel like something is going on keep pushing go get another opinion i know that it sucks but literally you'll avoid a lot of crap like getting di misdiagnosed pardon me with pid freaking the heck out about that um and then winding up in the er because you can't keep the meds down that they diagnosed you with the PID to help you for, like, it just, 
it racks my head. So now I'm sitting in the ER. My mom is over here. She's like, I know you have endometriosis, Monica. We've talked about this, which we did and did on multiple occasions prior to leading up to this. Um, because now at this point, we've done some research behind the scenes, right? We're like, well, what else could be going on? And unfortunately, the only way to diagnose endometriosis is by entering the female body surgically. Tell me how this makes sense. For a disease that affects one in 10 women, that literally can create infertility and, and make women disabled to the point where they can't work, yet it can only be diagnosed by a surgery? I was like, oh, yay, mom, I really hope I have this. But you know what? At that point, I honestly did hope that I had endometriosis because at least then, at least then I would have an explanation or like a name for all of those years of like pain that just didn't make sense. That wasn't a painful period. There's something else wrong. So we were in that hospital and we begged for a laparoscopy. We had to beg for one, but we said all of the symptoms add up to endometriosis, get in there and figure it out. They did and sure enough, I was full of scar tissue and fibroids and a whole mess of things. It was very bittersweet coming out of that surgery because my, my fears were confirmed that I did have endometriosis and that I was going to live with this forever. Um, but at the same time, I was like, you know what? I can do this because now I know at least what I'm fighting. It... I'm sorry. I have not talked about this. Um... At the end of that surgery, it was just outpatient. So it was literally, um, you know, same day in and out laparoscopy. And then it was like a, like a two week recovery time at home. And I don't remember, you know, and it wasn't a crazy difficult recovery. I mean, I had a few incisions that were maybe a few centimeters maybe even a centimeter or two long across my stomach um, where they had to go in. But again, they were really, really small incisions um, where a lot of the just, it was just internally, you know, you're recovering from surgery. So it's just about two weeks is what I remember. But they told me that here's, here's the, here's the clincher. Well, Monica, you're going to have to get the surgery done again in about probably another two years, depending on how your symptoms are and how they progress over, you know, the next, the next few years. You're going to need to have another laparoscopy done because your scar tissue is just going to build right back up again with time. You still have all of your hormones, your organs, everything like that. So... Um, one of my biggest fears 
is that my endometriosis is going to make it impossible for me to have children, to have a little Monica one day. And being 33, not being with anyone, it's difficult for me because I want to be a mom so bad, but I don't know. I don't know if it's in the cards for me. And just kind of knowing that I have to come to terms with that possibility. Um, I mean, it's been about seven or eight years since I've been diagnosed with this and I still cry almost every day. Thank you guys again for watching and um, like, subscribe, comment. <laughs> what a better time than now um, as I'm trying to catch my thoughts. Anyways, so I soaked in the news that I was going to have to have surgery again in another two years. And in that time frame, I had found, um, via my mom again, a, via a referral from her OBGYN, um, an amazing doctor, surgeon. Um, he's a gynecological oncologist who, you know, specializes literally in this type of, in this type of thing. Um, and I saw him about close to two years uh, after my first laparoscopy so it was actually about four years ago now and we ran some tests we did you know the normal consult visits where i'm you know filling out the paperwork he's you know doing ultrasound exams and again invaded poked and prodded and he just says so I go back, you know, for his findings, you know, to see what he wants to do. And he says, we definitely need to do another robotic, we need to do a robotic laparoscopy, pardon me, uh, where we actually use a robot named Da Vinci, which I got a kick out of, honestly, I still do, uh, where we use a, a robot named Da Vinci and we literally go inside and we do the same thing, only it's, it's very, very, very precise. Um, but because I had so many different, I mean, I literally have, scar, I've had scar tissue attached to my appendix. So so he was like, you know, you really have kind of a mess going in there. And um, Da Vinci's gonna clean that out. So um, it's gonna be a little bit more of an extensive laparoscopy than your last one. You know, you are gonna have an overnight stay in the hospital. Um, from what I can see, you may need to lose your left ovary. Um, and we're definitely taking your appendix out um, because there's scar tissue attached to it. Uh, yeah, so he's like, expect to, you know, wake up with a catheter. He's like, there will be a little, um, like, tube thing, like, full kind of, it was full kind of a, my blood from a tube that was, like, just kind of catching all the blood that was bleeding internally just to make sure that it didn't build up inside. It was catching it on the outside. Um, this overnight, this surgery was different than the first one um I think it was just being in the hospital overnight to be honest and I've, I've never had a catheter before I had never had like that blood bag I don't know what it's called um, that like blood catcher tube bottle thing it was like this weird I don't even know um 
it was such a surreal experience and I remember having the worst anxiety attack in the middle of the night so nobody was there with me it was just you know it was like two in the morning and I had woken up I think one of my IVs had gone off or something like that you know you know the, all the beeping in the hospitals everyone's familiar with that so something had woken me up and I think it just hit me that I woke up in so much pain and with you know, just looking down and just like realizing what had happened. You know, I had many more incisions than the first time. So you might even be able to like see one. Yeah, right there. It's a pretty visible one. Um, but they're, they're, it looks like a constellation chart. My stomach really, if I were to do like an up close um, thing about it. But um, wow, you guys, I didn't think I was going to get this emotional. Thank you so much for just sticking with me. Um, this is hard to talk about. Uh, this is why, again though, I think that it's important because if some, if someone sees this and is like, oh my gosh, you know, I just wanna go give my sister, or my aunt or my cousin who has endometriosis a hug because of this video that I saw that's like what I want and I just endometriosis is a disease that you cannot see you can't see the fact that I'm due that I have my next robotic laparoscopy scheduled for a month from now it's scheduled for April 19th granted I have to push it out but you guys I'm looking to go through all of this again I'm not looking forward to it. But I'm doing it again for the possibility that one day I will get married and hopefully be able to have a beautiful, healthy baby or more than one, if if that, if God allows. <laughs> um, but again, this is a very, very real disease that affects women in multiple facets. Some women, again, do not know that they have this. Consider yourselves lucky if you are one of if you are one of them. Um, I always tell people that I would rather have endometriosis and deal with this every day than maybe another woman or girl getting chosen to take on this disease because maybe they maybe they wouldn't be able to handle it. So I would understand that sometimes. So if that is the case, I will bear this happily so that another woman doesn't have to. I hope that sharing my story and the fact that um I'm living with this forever kind of hits home makes you think a little bit about your own health the health of the people that you love the women that you love it is definitely endometriosis awareness month I live with endometriosis every day and I kick its ass every single day I plan on continuing to do that. Um, like, subscribe, comment. Thank you again so much for watching. Um, if you have any experiences with this disease, I'd love to hear about them. And um, thank you.